chapter 31 of Laura Hillenbrand's Unbroken, uh, which starts on page 307. If you remember the end of chapter 30, the big event was that the atomic bomb was just dropped on Hiroshima. And so we know that the end of World War II is just around the corner. Um, from Louis' perspective, they don't know exactly what happened, but they saw that huge mushroom cloud, the big cloud and the fire from the bomb. They said it looked like it was going three miles into the air. Um, and so this chapter uh, is going to pick up right there. And this is called The Naked Stampede. So here we go. The Nuetsu POWs knew that something big had happened. The guards paced around with stricken faces. Civilians walked past the camp, eyes dazed, hands in fists. A guard said something to Louis that stuck in his head. Hiroshima had been hit by cholera. Cholera is um, a sickness. The city was shut down, he said, and no one could come or go. At one of the work sites, a civilian told a different story. One American bomb, he said, had destroyed an entire city. The POWs thought that he must have meant one raid with many bombs, but the man kept repeating that it was one bomb. He used a word that sounded like atomic. The word was unfamiliar, and no one knew how one bomb could wipe out a city. Tom Wade got hold of a newspaper. Something in the paper called an electronic bomb had been dropped, and many people had died. The POWs didn't know what to make of it. Just as an aside, um, the atomic bomb was top secret. There was this thing called the Manhattan Project, and that was what they called um, all of the experiments and the lab work that was going into building the bomb. Um, Remember that FDR, President Roosevelt, was the president of the U.S. during World War II? His vice president was Harry Truman. This was so top secret that Harry Truman had no idea they were building an atomic bomb, even though they had built it. So President Roosevelt died just right before the end of the war. President Truman takes over, and uh, as he becomes president, they tell him, hey, we've developed this bomb. You have to decide whether or not to use it. So he has no idea this bomb even exists, and then bam, he has to decide whether or not to drop the bomb, and clearly he did. So that's how unknown this was at this point in time. At Amori, the shaken camp commander gathered the POWs. One plane came over, he said, and a whole city disappeared. He asked if anyone knew what weapon could do such a thing. No one had an answer. On August 9th, Nagasaki, like Hiroshima, disappeared. So there were two atomic bombs, little boy and big boy, one dropped on Hiroshima and then a couple days later on Nagasaki. And this will mark the official end of the war for us. Uneasy days passed. Everything in Nuetsu remained the same and day and night the POWs were still sent to labor in Japan's war production factories. Clearly something catastrophic had happened, but Japan had not given in. And here you can see it says the aftermath of the atomic bombing of Nagasaki on August 9th. And so you can see that the city's just completely destroyed. There's nothing left. For the POWs, time had all but run out. It was now approaching mid-August and the kill-all policy loomed. Even if Japan surrendered, many POWs believed that the guards would kill them anyway, either out of vengeance or to prevent them from testifying to what had been done to them. Indeed, an Amori interrogator had told Commander Fitzgerald that the Japanese had plans to kill the POWs in the event that they lost the war. With officials talking about taking them to a new camp in the hills, the POWs believed that the Japanese planned to dump their bodies in a mountain forest where no one would ever find them. They discussed defending themselves, but they had no answers to 25 guards with rifles. Escape, too, was impossible. The camp was cornered against the sea in two rivers, and there's no way to get boats for 700 prisoners. The only route was up toward the village, where the sickly, weak men would be caught easily. They were fish in a barrel, meaning they're really easy to catch, right? Picture a bunch of fish swimming around in a, in a barrel. Louis lingered in his bunk, fading, praying. In his nightmares, he and the bird fought death matches, the bird trying to beat him to death, Louis trying to strangle the life from the sergeant. He'd been staying as far as he could from the bird, who had been whipping about camp like a severed power line, but the sergeant always hunted him down. Then abruptly, the violence stopped. The bird had left camp. The guard said that he had gone to the mountains to ready the promised new camp for the POW officers. The August 22nd kill-all-death date was one week away. 
On August 15th, Louis woke gravely ill. He was now having some 20 bloody bowel movements a day. So 20 times a day, he's pooping and there's blood in it. He's really sick. It's really serious. After the month's weigh-in, he didn't record his weight in his diary, but he did note that he'd lost six kilos, more than 13 pounds, from a frame already wasted from starvation. When he gripped his leg, his fingers sank in and the imprints remained for long after. He'd seen too many men die to be ignorant of what this meant. Very, very. In late morning, after the night work crews had dragged in and the day crews had headed off, Louis crept out of the barracks. With the bird away, it was safer to walk in the open. Crossing the compound, Louis saw Ogawa, his overseer at the potato field. Ogawa had always been an innocuous man, one of the few Japanese whom Louis had never had reason to fear. But when he saw Louis, Ogawa yanked out his club and struck Louis in the face. Louis reeled in astonishment, his cheek bleeding. A few minutes later at noon, the compound was suddenly, eerily silent. The Japanese were all gone. At the same moment, in the factory mess halls, the POWs looked up from their bowls to realize that they were alone. The guards had left. In camp, Tinker walked through the compound. Passing the guard room, he glanced inside. There were the guards, crowded around a radio in rapt attention, listening to a small, halting Japanese voice. Something of great importance was being said. At the factories, at half past one, the guards reappeared and told the POWs to get back to their stations. As Ken Marvin returned to his station, he found his overseer sitting down. One of the Japanese told him that there was no work. Looking around, Marvin spotted Bad Eye, the one-eyed civilian guard he'd been teaching incorrect English, and asked him why there was no work. Bad Eye replied that there was no electricity. Marvin looked up. All of the light bulbs were burning. He turned quizzically to Bad Eye and told him that the lights were on. Bad Eye said something in Japanese, and Marvin wasn't sure. Sorry about that. I'm going to move the camera. Marvin wasn't sure he understood. Marvin found a friend fluent in Japanese, pulled him into the room, and asked Bad Eye to repeat what he said. The war is over. Marvin began sobbing. He and his friend stood together, bawling like children. The workers were marched back to camp. Marvin and his friends hurried among the POWs, sharing what Bad Eye had said, but not one of their listeners believed it. Everyone had heard this rumor before, and each time it had turned out to be false. In camp, there was no sign that anything had changed. The camp officials explained that the work had been suspended only because there had been a power outage. A few men celebrated the peace rumor, but Louis and many others were anticipating something very different. Someone had heard that Noetsu was slated to be bombed that night. The POWs couldn't sleep. Marvin lay on his bunk, telling himself that if they were sent to work in the morning, Bad Eye's story must have been false. If they weren't, maybe the war was over. Louis hunkered down, miserably ill, waiting for the bombers. So the war really was done, um, but the men can't know that because they have no connection with the outside world. They don't understand Japanese to follow along with what everyone else is saying. So they just have to wait and see what happens. No B-29s flew over Noetso that night. In the morning, the work crews were told that there was no work and were dismissed. Upstairs, Louis began vomiting. As he bobbed in a fog of nausea, someone came to his bunk and handed him five letters. They were from Pete, Sylvia, and his parents, all written many months earlier. Louis tore open the letters and out came photographs of his family. It was the first that Louis had seen or heard of them in nearly two and a half years. He clutched his letters and hung on. The POWs were in a state of confusion. The guards would tell them nothing. A day passed with no news. When night fell, the men looked over the countryside and saw something they'd never seen before. The village was illuminated in the darkness. The blackout shades all over Noetsu had been taken down. As a test, some of the POWs removed the shades of the barrack windows. The guards ordered them to put the shades back up. If the war had ended, the guards were going to considerable lengths to hide this fact from the POWs. The kill-all date was five days away. So blackout shades are the things that you cover your windows with so that there's no light, so that when the planes fly over and they're bombing, they won't see the cities, right? So they look at the city and they see that they have all their blackout shades off. But the guards are still telling them to keep their shades on and they know that this kill-all order is approaching. The next day, Louis was sicker still. He examined his feeble body and scrawled sad words in his diary. 
look like skeleton, feel weak. The bird reappeared, apparently back from preparing whatever lay in store for the POWs in the mountains. He looked different, a shade of a mustache darkening his lip. Louis saw him step into his office and close the door. On August 17th, at Rokushiri POW camp on the frigid summit of a Japanese mountain, a telephone rang. Phil Garrett and more than 350 other Rokushiri POWs were shivering through summer inside the barracks, trying to survive on a nearly all-liquid diet. In this extremely remote, deathly quiet camp, the lone telephone hardly ever rang, and the POWs noticed it. A few minutes later, the Japanese commander hurried out of camp and down the mountain. For some time, the Rokushiri prisoners had been racked with tension. All summer, the sky had been scratched with vapor trails. One night in July, the men had looked from the barracks to see the whole southern horizon lit up in red, generating light so bright that the men could read by it. On August 8th, the guards had been nailing the barracks door shut. Then on August 15th, the guards had suddenly become much more brutal, and the POW's workload breaking rocks on a hillside had been intensified. After the commander left, something troubling happened. The guards began bringing the POWs out of the barracks and dividing them into small groups. Once they had the men assembled, they herded them out of the camp and deep into the mountain forest, heading nowhere. After pushing the men onward through the trees for some time, the guards led the men back to camp and into the barracks. Later, the walks were repeated. No explanation was given. The guards seemed to be inuring the men to this strange routine, in preparation for something terrible. On August 20th, a white sky stretched over Noetsu, heavy and threatening. There was a shout in the compound. All POWs were to assemble outside. Some 700 men tramped out of the barracks and formed lines before the building. The little camp commander, gloves on his hands and a sword on his hip, stepped atop the air raid spotter's platform and Kono climbed up behind beside him. The commander spoke, and Kono translated, the war has come to a point of cessation or ceasing, stopping. There was no reaction from the POWs. Some believed it, but kept silent for fear of rep reprisal. They don't want to get in trouble if they celebrate. Others suspecting a trick did not, right? They didn't believe it. The commander went on, becoming strangely solicitous, speaking as if the POWs were old friends. He voiced his hope that the prisoners would help Japan fight the Red Menace, the Soviet Union, which had just seized Japan's Kuril Islands. With the commander's speech finished and the POWs waiting in suspicious silence, Kono invited the POWs to bathe in the Hokuro River. This, too, was odd. The men had only rarely been allowed to go in the river. The POWs broke from their lines and began hiking down to the water, dropping clothes as they walked. Louis dragged along after them, peeled off his clothes, and waded in. All over the river, the men scattered, scrubbing their skin, unsure what was happening. Then they heard it. It was the growl of an aircraft engine, huge, low, and close. The swimmers looked up, and at first they saw nothing but the overcast sky. Then there it was, bursting from the clouds, a torpedo bomber. As the men watched, the bomber dove, leveled off, and skimmed over the water, its engine screaming. The POWs looked up at it. The bomber was headed straight toward them. In the instant before the plane shot overhead, the men in the water could just make out the cockpit and inside the pilot standing. Then the bomber was right over them. On each side of the fuselage and on the underside of each wing, there was a broad white star in blue circle. The plane was not Japanese. It was American. The plane's red code light was blinking rap rapidly. A radio man in the water near Louis read the signals and suddenly cried out, Oh, the war is over. In seconds, masses of naked men were stampeding out of the river and up the hill. As the plane turned loops above, the pilot waving, the POWs swarmed into the compound, out of their minds with relief and rapture. Their fear of the guards on the, of the massacre they had so long awaited was gone, dispersed by the roar and muscle of the bomber. The prisoners jumped up and down, shouted and sobbed. Some scrambled onto the camp roofs, waving their arms and singing out their joy to the pilot above. Others piled against the camp fence and sent it crashing over. Someone found matches, and soon the entire length of fence was burning. The Japanese shrank back and withdrew. In the midst of the running, celebrating men, Louis stood on wavering legs, 
emaciated or starving, sick, and dripping wet. In his tired mind, two words were repeating themselves over and over. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Down on the riverbank, a battered Australian POW named Matt Cliff sat on the water's edge. His eyes were on the torpedo bomber, which was swooping overhead, alternately crossing over the river and then the camp. As Cliff watched, something flitted out of the cockpit, trailing a long yellow ribbon. It carried through the air westward, directed toward the river. Cliff stood up, leaned over the water, and reached out so far that he was on the verge of falling in. The object, a little wooden packet, dropped right into his hand. Regaining his balance with the treasure in his grasp, Clift had a delightful thought. Chocolate! His heart filled with gratitude for the damn good bloke of a pilot above. Cliff spent some time trying to twist the packet open, and at some point realized, to his crushing disappointment, that it wasn't chocolate. When he finally got it open, he found a handwritten message inside. Our TBFS, which it tells you down here is Torpedo Bomber, haven't been able to get through this stuff today. We'll lead them back tomorrow with food and stuff. Lieutenant A.R. Hawkins, VF-31, FPO Box 948, Lufkin, Texas. Before he flew off, Haw Hawkins dropped two gifts, a candy bar with a bite taken out of it, and a 20-count packet of cigarettes with one missing. Fitzgerald had the candy bar sliced into 700 slivers, and each man licked a finger, dabbed it on his bit of chocolate, and put it in his mouth. Louis' portion was the size of an ant. Then Fitzgerald had the men form 19 circles, each of which received one cigarette. Each man got one delectable puff. Another American plane thrummed over, and a man fell out of it. Down and down he fell, and his parachute didn't open. Everyone gasped. Then they realized it wasn't a man, it was a pair of pants. Stuff full of something, the waist and leg holes tied shut. The officers retrieved the pants, and Louis stood among them as the waist was opened. Inside, sitting atop a pile of goods, was an American magazine. On the cover was a photograph of an impossibly voluminous bomb cloud. So this giant bomb cloud is on top of the magazine. The men fell silent, piecing together the rumors of one giant bomb vaporizing Hiroshima or making the whole city just turn to gas and the abrupt end to the war. Below the magazine were cartons of cigarettes and candy bars and very soon the compound was littered with wrappers and naked skinny smoking men. Remember they're all naked because they're bathing in the river. In a pocket Fitzgerald found a letter belonging to the pants owner. The man had been busy. He had a wife in California and a girlfriend in Perth. The rock still sat at the foot of the barracks window, Louis' rope tied around it, but the conspirators were too late. The bird was nowhere to be found. Sometime that day, or perhaps the day before, he had taken off his uniform, picked up a sack of rice, slipped into the Nuetsu countryside, and vanished. And there we pause.